Guys, welcome back to the After Action Review. You know me, I'm Nick Guy, the world's most okay Green Beret. And in keeping with the tradition that we've set, we're not bringing other okay Green Berets on, we're bringing phenomenal Green Berets on. With us, we have Joe Kent, an SF legend in his own right, and probably the owner of the best hair in the game. Joe, thanks for ha ha coming on. Yeah, thanks, man. Thanks for having me on, and uh, thanks for the introduction. I probably yeah. just started a uh, – you probably just started a Green Beret retiree war right there with the best hair. <laughs> well, dude, I mean, I knew it was, like, good, and then, you know, you popped up, and it was down here. I was like, man. Yeah, it's coming I, in, man. It's coming in. Yeah, you got, the, you got like, the Captain Cook going on, too. That's, that's Yeah, the, cool. the, the, the beard power is not as strong as the top hair power. but Yeah, you know. that's all right. That's all right. Yeah. You got the flow. Yeah, so tonight we're gonna we're gonna talk about all this all this craziness going down in Iraq. Um, you know, whether or not we're looking at protesters, whether or not we're looking at Shia militia groups that are back, you know, funded and backed by Iran, uh, the United States response to that. And we're going uh, we're gonna talk about Shannon Kent. And if you guys don't know, Joe is the widower of one of the greatest hitters this country has lost and in the newest iteration of the GWAT, and that's Syria. Uh, Shannon Kent, U.S. crypto tech, who was assigned to, and correct me if I'm wrong, but a, a tier one element? Yeah, I mean, colloquially speaking, tier one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in in Manbij early last year. Uh, so we'll be talking about her, the, the legacy that she leaves, and uh, the, the work that was so important to her. So... Starting off, uh, we'll we'll take it back to to current events. Joe, I know you have a you have a uh, column out on Fox News that that came out on Fox News regarding all of this. Um, I I read it. I thought it was it was it was a phenomenal phenomenal read. If you guys haven't checked that out, I'll uh, I'll put the description in in the link for you guys to read it. But um, I mean, just if, in case anybody hasn't read it. It, it you know I, I want to hear your thoughts on here. So taking it back, take it away from your initial reaction and this analysis of you know 24 or 48 hours later. Now that you've had time to think about it, yes, I'm sure everyone's aware of the the overall situation on the ground in uh, in Iraq right now. Like yesterday, the uh, U.S. embassy, which is our largest embassy overseas, was besieged by rioters um, under the control of Qatab al Hezbollah. Um, which is an Iranian proxy group. A lot of folks don't know a ton about um, Qatab al-Hezbollah because they do a pretty good job of keeping themselves relatively in the shadows. They have some public figures, um, but they're probably Iran's most lethal and capable proxy group on the ground uh, in Iraq and even expanding into Syria. Um, all that comes as a response to a uh, rocket attack that happened up in the uh, K-1 military base in the town of Kirkuk, killed a U.S. contractor. So President Trump did the right thing and actually took lethal action against the Iranians and against Qatab al-Hezbollah and struck uh, several targets, two of which were in Syria and three of which are in Iraq, known Qatab al-Hezbollah bases, um, to show them that, hey, like you guys can't get away with shooting rockets um, at our bases. Um, those are kind of the facts. Day later, the Iranians um, directed KH um, to launch this series of pro uh, not protests, but riots outside the U.S. Embassy. Um, the Iraqi government didn't do anything because the Iraqi government is largely under the control of the Iranians. Um, and that, that goes back to 2003 when we came into Iraq, removed Saddam, and we really allowed the Iranians to stack the deck in their favor. There was uh, numerous Iranian dissident groups, um, or excuse me, Iraqi dissident groups that were funded and trained uh, by Iran during the Iraq-Iran war. Um, and the Iranians kept those guys in reserve, kept them trained, um, and they were ready once we got rid of Saddam. They had those guys move in and really take over the Iraqi government. We were, we were in a dead sprint to make sure that a legit government stood up in Iraq. So we didn't do our due diligence. Um, well, we did do our due diligence. We, we knew who these guys were. It wasn't a mystery. They didn't sneak one by us. I mean, I was on the ground then, um, as a lot of guys in, in fifth group and in SF were. Um, dealing with some of these guys back in, back then. We, we knew exactly who they were um, and what their intent was, but they were the best organized group with the exception of the Kurds, but the Kurds didn't have the uh, popular support because they're 
a smaller group than the Shias. Um, so we let them really take over the Iraqi government. Um, and there's a series of milestones um, from 03 all the way up until the time that we went through um, where we saw exactly what these guys were going to do. They were going to seize power, do exactly what Iran said. Um, and we, quite frankly, because we were, again, in a dead sprint to make Iraq look successful, we just sort of let it all slide, hoping it would all kind of buff out. Um, that started with the Bush administration. Um, he wanted to kind of sweep past the part where we didn't find any WMDs and the links to Al-Qaeda were sketchy at best um, and say, hey, look, we still did stand up a, a stable democratic government here in Iraq. Um, and then Obama further furthered that, uh, that issue for a different reason. Obama had no, he didn't have Iraq, the, uh, the vote for Iraq on his political record. Um, and he was eager to cut a deal with the Iranians. Um, so ideological reasons uh, from both parties, we ended up in the situation where Iran controls most of Iraq. And then everyone knows the ISIS story. ISIS came in, the Iraqi military that we paid for threw down their weapons and surrendered. Um, and we had to we had to strike back um, with our air power with SOF, um, but also we needed bodies to replenish the Iraqi military. Well, Iran realized this was a, a great opportunity, and they filled the ranks of the Iraqi military with what's known as Fashid al Shabi or the PMU PMF, the Popular Mobilization Units, Popular Popular Mobilization Forces, um, and those guys were all not all. A lot of them were just young Shia kids that were looking to defend their turf but the good deal of the leadership was recruited and trained by Iran. Um, the Iraqi government went ahead and made them part of the actual military. So they received U.S. weapons, U.S. funding. Um, they fought against ISIS because they believe in the sectarian, they, they, they were trying to advance the sectarian civil war that's going on throughout the Middle East. So them and ISIS traded atrocities for a while. We broke ISIS's back um, and the Shia militias took back over. And so that's kind of where we find ourselves today. Um, what I think is unique about the situation right now is both Iran and Iraq, their, their populations are not happy with the actions of the Iranian government. There's a good deal of protesting going on right now. Um, so there's protesters kind of over on the other side of the river uh, outside the green zone uh, in Iraq right now. They're demanding the Iranians get out of their country. Um, and the Iraqi government is not happy about that because the Iraqi government, again, works for Iran. Um, so my, my personal belief is that the Kitab al-Hezbollah starting to shoot again at our bases and get us out of Iraq um, has a lot to do with diverting the attention away from what they're doing in Iraq um, and putting the spotlight on us, hoping that we strike back, which we had to, in order to rally the people um, around what the Iraqi flag or some cause other than their own corruption. And I think it's, it was fascinating watching it play out like on social media in real time. I mean, you could log on to Twitter and just using a couple different hashtags and yeah. my very rudimentary uh, one, one in MSA right. <laughs> and Google translate, you could kind of see it, how it was playing out. Um, and, and like you said, you had the protests outside the green zone, which are very much for this kind of this national, you know, nationalism driven, you know, let's free Iraq of the Iranian dog that's, you know, has its jaws clamped on our throats versus what was organized by the Iranians. So, I, I mean, I have to ask, I mean, from where you're standing, what's the end game? You know, both, both the Iranian population and the Iraqi population on a whole are unhappy with the, with the Iranian regime. The Iranian regime, instead of trying to, I don't know, win favor with its own people, decided to test its newfound, well, I wouldn't say newfound, but still fledgling regional, regional power status that it's had since 2005, 2006, by, you know, propping up a government outside of its own borders. But what, what's the end game? I mean, are they, are they trying to unify the Iraqi and the Iranian Shias under one banner? I mean, it's, it's, that seems ridiculous considering that whole region of the world, you know, 40, what is it? 40% of Iraq is still Sunni. You know, it's not like an overwhelming Shia majority. Yeah. I mean, I think Iran's in game is to be a, a regional powerhouse. Um, and they've, they've done a really good job of uh, making that happen. I mean, they definitely kind of had the devil's luck in, in the sense that, um, uh, both the neocons and the, uh, the globalists kind of played into their favor. So Bush got rid of Saddam. That was their number one threat. 
And then we just continued to make mistake after mistake in Iraq where we got rid of the entire Ba'ath Party, disenfranchised the Sunnis, like I explained. Um, and, and, and you know, the Iranians then took over the Iraqi government. And then ISIS rose up as a result of the Sunni population um, living under, you know, both Maliki in Iraq and Assad in Syria, rose up, created ISIS. The world had to deal with that. So we, primarily we, but also the coalition acted as Iran's air force. They had the boots on the ground. They had done the force multiplication um, and they had the, the bodies to go ahead and fill in that void. Um, so I think right now they want to maintain that. Um, some Oh, hold on, buddy. We lost audio. Uh, so I think they want to maintain that and they want to get us into a, uh, a situation where we cut some sort of a deal, especially leading up to an election year that gives them sanctions relief so they can maintain their, um, their tentacles and all their different proxy forces. Because these proxies, as, as we know, as SF guys, they run on cash. They, <laughs> uh, I mean, that's, that's just a simple fact. If they can't pay these cats, then they're not going to have the amount of influence, regardless of how tight the Shia Brotherhood is, um, on their proxies all the way from Iraq into Syria, into Yemen, into Bahrain, that they, that they do right now. They also need Iraq to help circumvent sanctions. We, the U.S., have been extremely generous with granting the, uh, the Iraqis sanctions relief and trying to get Iraq's economy back online. We've even let Iraq trade with Iran because we realize that they're next door neighbors and they need to trade. So Iran has done a really, really slick job of benefiting from the um, concessions we've made to Iraq uh, economically. So right now I think Iran really wants a deal with us. Um, but what I, think, what I think really sucks for us is that like, it's kind of a win-win for Iran. Um, if we stay and we get bogged back down in Iraq, then they can gain back some of their popular support because they can go back to their people and say, hey, look, the Americans are still on two of our borders. We're still a country at war. You need to rally around the regime. You need to rally around the flag. And that's kept, that, that's kept Iran it, afloat since 1979, um, especially with the Iraq-Iran war. Um, but then also if we, um, if we depart, they're going to claim some sort of a victory. Uh, in, in my column, I kind of advocated that, hey, we've, we've sort of ran to the limits of what we can do militarily let's step back and crush these guys financially because they need the finances and we have the finances. So we don't need them. They need us. Let's try to financially choke these guys off as opposed to playing GWAT again, where we go back and we try and play whack-a-mole with every single random KH guy. And while we get our, our own people blown up, chasing them around for, for no gain. Absolutely. And, and you're hundred percent right. They're they're They have their tentacles and in, in all sorts of business in Iraq. So, the military option is going to be a repeat of, of what we were dealing. And we were, we were dealing with, we were dealing with, you know, Cuds forces in Iraq. I, I dealt with Cuds forces in Syria. I mean, they're, yeah. they're, they're all over the place. They're not going to go away. Um, and the military option is just going to continue that status quo. So when it comes to the, like, that financial choking, I mean, are we going to have you know, there's something to be said about the, what the last administration did in terms of lessening sanctions. And, you know, it's kind of a trope, but it, it's, there's a truth to it in the palace of cash that, um, that we sent to Iran. Yeah. Um, I understand it was frozen assets, but at the same time, my God, if they're using the money to wage state sponsored terror, yeah. you know, what, what choice do we have? So, if we were to go that route, and like you had mentioned, uh, you know, it, it's an open secret that we allowed Iraq to trade with Iran in an effort to bump their economy up. I mean, if we were going to go that route, are we going to have? Would we see a uh, heavier financial burden? Do you think on the part of America to keep Iraq's economy afloat? Because at this point, we have so much. I hate to say it, but you have it's. It kind of falls into that whole forever war and these quagmire scenarios, but. At what point do we have so much invested in terms of actual treasure in the in Iraq that we can't really say, you know what, we're done with it? Because we can't. I mean, so if we choke them off, if we totally cut Iran off, we tell Iraq, hey, no more trade. If we somehow are able to affect political change to push these Iranian 
influencers out. Is that, is that the only way forward? Just a heavier burden on the United States financially? I don't, I don't think we would really suffer financially that much. I mean, we would take some obvious losses when we pulled people out and then the Iranians would make some big show of taking over an American compound or maybe even the U.S. embassy. But at the end of the day, like that's kind of a drop in the bucket and we're already spending that money as opposed to getting into a conflict where we're spending more U.S. taxpayer dollars to bomb and fight guys that are equipped with U.S. weapons. Um, and then not to mention the, the actual human cost of us losing more guys over there for, you know, really no clear in-state. Um, I, I think we could very clearly tell Iraq, hey, you guys remember the 1990s when you were under sanctions? Like, we're going to go back to that, the set of sanctions that the world has on Iran right now. If you guys want to be Iran, we'll treat you like Iran. And we'll just leave. And then make Iraq choose. Like, hey, do you guys want to be part of the world that the U.S. is the gateway to? Or do you want to have to play the sanctions game? I know you can stay alive doing it. And then Iran's, at that point, like, especially if they have no Americans within striking distance of, I, I, what are they going to do? Then they're going to have to answer to the protesters. And the protests are going to get more and more furious because Iraq's going to be choked off. Um, and to me, that's, a, that's an option we just haven't tried. Like, we have the world's biggest economy, yet we're running around. Like, we desperately need to be in a lot of these backwaters. Oh, lost your audio. Yeah, I paused. It came up and said, oh, like, there we go. You good? Yeah. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, it, it's definitely interesting, man. And, you know, I, you, you, we can go on about the, the memes and the tropes of globalism and neoconservatism um, and the fact that we've tried it for, God, now two decades yeah. in, in that region. And, and what do we have to show for it? So, I, it, it's definitely a valid, valid point. Um, so, so we've talked about, we've talked about that side of the house, like the, the, the neoconservatives, but yesterday, yeah, yesterday, the, I don't, I don't know if you saw, but social media kind of blew up in response by comparing what happened to Benghazi. And yeah. a lot of, a lot of people were just jumping I don't want to. I don't want to speak for them and say they were gleeful about it, but it, a lot of these tweets seemed like they were excited for the possibility of an American embassy staffed with security personnel, and then U.S. you know a hundred additional U.S. Marines being overrun and yeah. slaughtered to score political points. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> I I found I found it as you know, especially since it was it was led by a. Uh, a veteran organization or what yeah, they yeah. vote vets. Right. Yeah, dude, that, that, that seemed ridiculous, man. I mean, have we just, have we just totally lost our bearings when it comes to situations like this, that we can't even pull together for, you know, a, a time of potential national crisis. If it yeah, means everyone, everyone's lost their minds, man. I mean, it's whatever you want to call it. Trump derangement syndrome or, I mean, Trump definitely punches back when, People talk smack and, you know, I appreciate that as a more conservative guy. Um, but at the same time, like when the country's in crisis and American lives are on stake, I don't, I, I don't remember that ever really being partisan. Even at the height of the Iraq war, when, when there was a lot of Bush hate going on, I, I don't remember anyone on the left, any, any serious person, you know, hoping that like the Iraqi insurgents, you know, made Bush look bad by killing Americans. Like, I, I don't, I don't, it might have happened, but it, it certainly didn't happen in huge numbers, you know, like we see right now. It, it's, it's, I don't know if it's just a, if we're in a product of our times, if this was always where we were headed with, yeah. with the political divide. But, um, I mean, it is, it is ridiculous because everything is hyper partisan, everything is, an opportunity to score points. But I, I, me personally, I don't know if you saw it. That's why I commented, but like, Oh my God, like you have American lives at risk. Just put it to, just put it to bed yeah. for, you know, 24 hours and just say, wow, I really hope those 18 and 19 year old kids who are standing, literally standing on the wall are going to be right. okay. 
And like you said, it's, it's crazy coming from a vets group. I think, I think I saw it because you replied to it. I'm still new to Twitter, so I don't really under, fully understand how it works. But uh, then, then someone pointed out that like there was a couple, you know, whatever, stolen Valor fakers in that group. And my first thought was, fuck, man, I hope they're all stolen Valor fakers. Like, right? I hope these aren't real fucking vets, man. That's the scary part. Like, that's insane to me. Like, I don't care where you fall in the political aisle, especially if you've worn the uniform, whatever you did. Like, you should know that that's your buddies over there, man. Your brothers and sisters that are going to have to like, literally guard that wall yeah it's just i don't know man that's just yeah. it struck me as, as so odd um you expect it you expect i expected to see it out of uh what's her face uh joy no, I can't. joy behar the, the uh, not joy behar the cnn commentator you know the one that got busted for all those homophobic tweets oh right 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 yeah, yeah and yeah. then she said that her account was hacked it was great yeah, joy, joy Reed or something like that maybe yeah joy Reed. there it is yeah. yeah yeah i expected i expected it from her i didn't expect it from a vets group man that 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 was weird dude yeah i hope that's the end of that vets group <laughs> yeah that's wishful thinking yeah, right. they always, they crop up every once in a while with a with a terribly hot take like that. My God, yeah. Well, I mean, I kind of going into that. I mean, we'll we'll use that as a transition, man, because you talked about like your brothers and sisters, you know, standing on the wall, putting lives on the line. You know, my my first introduction to you was, you know, your time in the regiment was kind of before my time. I'm I'm still a somewhat new guy. I think I'm four years in the four years in the regiment now. Or four and a half, something like that. So your, your time was kind of before mine. So I, I know your, your SF reputation from guys that are still in and overlapped with your time. Nice. Um, but you, you know, you kind of came into my world because of your wife, Shannon Kent. And, you know, I, I kind of did that quick intro, but because I'm not Navy and I don't understand, you know, what exactly – she did for the Navy. I mean, I, I know what she did in Syria, but what she did for the Navy, how it came to be, I thought, wow, this is a phenomenal story. Cause you don't really hear about like, you don't hear about females in special operations. And I know it's a, I know it's a hot button issue. We're not going to get into it, but your wife kind of embodied like that, that female special operations asset that was yeah. critical to the on the ground mission success in yeah. Syria. So I, I, I mean, if you don't mind, man, I'd love for you to just kind of, you don't, you know, just tell, you know, your guys' story with, you know, sure. Shannon and you and, and her story. Yeah, man. So, um, Shannon was, like you said, uh, killed almost a year ago, uh, in Mambidge, Syria. That was her fifth, uh, soft combat deployment though. She kind of was on, uh, a woman in soft before there was women in soft. I know, I know there's some other women out there that were kind of the same era as her. So I'm not sure if she was ever the first. Um, but she started out, she joined the Navy in, uh, 2003. She was, uh, motivated to join by 9-11. She's a New Yorker. Her dad and her uncle were, uh, first responders to ground zero. Um, so she started the process of joining, uh, in 2002, shortly thereafter. Um, she always had a thing for languages. She loved studying languages or anything foreign. So she went in the recruiter's office and said, Hey, like, I know I can learn Arabic. I don't know it, but I know I can learn it. So how do I, how do I do that? Um, and then from there, she went on to uh, Monterey, to DLI, um, got rated as a crypto linguist, so basically a, a signals, signals intelligence collector. Um, and then she promptly volunteered for the uh, first thing smoking to Iraq. Um, obviously, it took her you know, a year and a half, two years to get through DLI. So her first deployment was in 07 to the Green Zone in Baghdad, um, and just as an individual augmentee. Um, she was doing SIGINT translation. Um, but whoever it was that she was working for saw that she had a talent for kind of reading between the lines and figuring out what people were saying and asked her if she wanted an opportunity to go support a special operations task force. So she ended up uh, supporting um, a, uh, one, one of the task forces that was actually targeting Shia militants um, that, I was, that I was working on as well. Um, and so we ran across each other real briefly in 07, um, had a conversation literally about she about she a bad guys who were probably trying to bring the embassy yesterday because you know that nothing really ever changes in the GWAT. um so she did uh so we, we uh didn't actually get to connect then we just saw each other real briefly and talked um 
she did uh, two more Iraq deployments after that. Um, she did so well in that deployment that she was offered a chance to come try out for a, uh, a new program within Naval Special Warfare called the uh, Special Reconnaissance Troop. Um, and so those guys basically are um, the combat enablers that do the intel work for the SEALs. Um, as you know, the SEALs are set up a little bit differently than, than we are. They bring in a lot of uh, enablers to do their intel work for them. And so, Shannon, mm -hmm. so she passed their selection process and then did two more Iraq deployments. Um, kind of found her way into going out and talking to Iraqis and collecting human intelligence. Um, so she got out from behind. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop you one second, dude. Do a uh, sound check. Let's see. We'll just keep we'll just keep uh how's that? There we go, we're back. Yep. We yeah. When I saw it freeze, I stopped, so <laughs> we'll see how it gets. So she worked her way into doing uh do it human. Um, and that's the majority of what she did was, was getting out there and, and mixing with the, uh, local population and collecting Intel. Um, and then also going out on raids and doing some tactical questioning with, uh, tactical questioning of the females. Um, she did two more Iraq deployments and then she did a uh, Afghan deployment where she was doing village stability operations with a, uh, with the seal platoon. And then later on a, uh, a SFOEA. Um, so she, was in the mix for all that. Um, before that Afghan deployment, she went to a selection process for a, uh, a little more niche unit within special operations. Um, and that's where, where we actually met. We didn't go to selection together, but we ended up in the qualification course for that unit. Um, gotcha. So we had a, uh, someone that she went to selection with, another female, and I did some uh, Arabic training together, and she ended up setting us up on a date while we were in class. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, uh, you know, we, we did the whole dating process where we were both in training and then, uh, got married right afterwards. And, uh, I got her pregnant and then deployed. And then I came home, uh, came home in time for the first kid. Um, and then got her pregnant again and deployed again. <laughs> <laughs> we did back for both the births. Um, so Shannon was, she was, she was doing the right thing and trying to make, uh, make our hectic deployment lives kind of settle down a little bit. So she applied for a PhD program for uh, psychology. She got accepted. The Navy said, Hey, you're, uh, you're ineligible because she had cancer surgery a while ago. Um, she had a little cancer thing cut out while I was in Iraq. Um, never missed a day of work. Um, and remain, remain, retained her deployable status, deployable with special operations, which is how she ended up in Syria. So she ended up in Syria with special operations task force. there hunting down ISIS. Um, up until the day that she was killed um, about last year. So. I, I mean, wow. I mean, I mean, her story is unique because you don't hear about females within SOF. Um, I think, you know, we're, we're not going to get into the details of, of special mission units. Um, we're not, but I think when people think soft, they think seals, I think SF Rangers, AFSOC, yeah. you know, PJs, what, CCTs and whatever their new thing is, special reconnaissance or something. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But a lot of people don't realize that there are other units within that hierarchy. Um, they don't fall under, you know, the typical special operations command. They fall under, and, and this for the benefit of people listening who might not know, they fall under a, a separate command, a higher command. Um, and we call them special mission units. You know, you hear it a lot in like video games, movies, books. They're tier one, you know, tier one units. And I, it's, it's funny because tier one sounds like it's the best. I, I learned as a brand new SF guy at the Erbil airport that tier just has, it just refers to the, uh, right. the, the funding allocation. It has nothing. It, yeah. That's all it is. Um, right. But uh but yeah, nobody realized that a lot of those higher echelon units, the more selective units, uh, even beyond your, your vanilla special operations, em employs women all the time. And it was something I was exposed to overseas a little bit, uh, but you don't really get to hear their stories, you know, yeah. you know be because of Shannon's sacrifice, because of what she gave, you know, that, that her story could kind of be told. But, you know, while they're, while they're so operational, nobody really hears about that. And, yeah, exactly. you know, I, that's why I think it is, her story is just 
it's awesome, man. Like that, that's incredible. And the fact that you guys literally, <laughs> I'm sorry, man. The fact that you guys literally got set up on a date in training is awesome. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty not 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 the most professional thing ever, but hey, what are you do? <laughs> no, no, that's all right. It, I honestly, your army, she's uh, yeah. Well, you know, it's, what do I, you know? It's, yeah, but but I that's awesome, man. And you know, when she when she was when she was killed, it it was it was huge news. I mean, you have a, a, a female service member in Syria. We didn't have a whole we didn't have a whole lot of people in Syria to begin with. Um, I I saw one other female in Syria. And that was the platoon leader of a high Mars unit that was co-located with us. We had some high Mars when we were down South, um, my third deployment there and the PL was female, but they never left. They never left the, you know, yeah. I, it, it's not really a fob. I don't know the cop. They never left the cop. Um, so you, it, it was, you know, you, you don't hear about it a whole lot. And then all of a sudden, boom, my God, this, you know, this, and then the picture started coming out. I was like, Oh man, like she's rocking kit. Like she's like in the rubble of man bitch. Like dude, this, she's badass, man. I mean, yeah. what? I, you almost have to be grateful that like this story was able to come out because what a fitting tribute to, you know, I, I, Twitter, I use the term hitter, but that's what she was. She was a pipe hitter. She just did work, man. Yeah. She just got after it. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah, I mean, her, her story would probably never have been told otherwise. Um, and, and Shannon was super humble, so she would be punching me right now for all the publicity I've given her. But I, I just, she always kind of felt like, you know, she was a, uh, like a soft enabler, like always halfway sort of in soft when really her entire career was in soft. And like, you know, I would, I would tell her all the time, like, you're. Oh, we lost audio one more time. Mic check. I don't have you yet. Let's see. There we go. I got you. There we go. Yeah. So now I would tell her, hey, I'm I'm kind of a dumb a dozen. There's a bunch of Green Beret dudes like me that can go do soft type of stuff. Um, but females that can do what you do and hang with us are very, very rare. Um, and, and just working in some of the places I got to work, I got the opportunity to work in special operations. I saw that there's, you know, there's not a lot, but there's a few women out there that are really, really doing essential work and they can hang with the guys um, and they're, they're assets. And so to the, the discussion about women and soft, I think to me gets very, very uh, simplified and, and almost just dumbed down about like how much can a woman ruck and how much can she bench press and crap like that. And, as you know, being in soft is like so much more in depth than, than just like your physical prowess. You have to have that because, you know, the kit weighs what it weighs and all that. But uh, especially in the environments we find ourselves in, the ability to think on your feet, um, understand cultures and languages and use critical thinking. Like she had all that in spades. Um, that's why she was such a, uh, an asset on the battlefield. So I'm, I'm, the only thing I'm, you know, really excited about is raising our kids and getting to tell her story. So, and that's incredible. I what 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 an incredible. I that is, I mean, God, what what a those kids have some some shoes to fill. But I, I something tells me they're they're going to be fine. But yeah, man, I just going back to it. Like me for me language. They when they gave me Arabic, I almost felt like crying. I'm like, my God, how am I going to learn Arabic? Damn, I was never great at Arabic. Um, I was better at talking you know just kind of the jarbled mess that the uh that the uh <laughs> the smugglers were speaking out in the syrian desert because oh, yeah, of, yep yeah you know then actual msa you know you put on like bbc Arabia, and i was like mm, no so <laughs> i like skills like that they are it's it's indispensable and if you can if you can if you can bring somebody with that critical thinking, with those language skills, and they're also a gun in the fight, that's um, that's like a thousand times better than just bringing like a turp along. Because right. you know, yeah. like I said, she's a gun in the fight. Yeah, and and so I think she kind of she definitely holds a, a, a special place amongst them, uh, amongst you know women in special operations. Um, 
And, uh, you know, as, as time goes forward, yeah, it, like you said, the debate, everybody gets heated. A lot of it gets dumbed down. But, you know, once you kind of pull the nuance away, um, my God, what an asset. Yeah, man, something Shannon always said, and this is, as the um, the debate was happening, Shannon was already, like, pretty well established and in, in, in soft. And there was a few women that were as well. Um, like, she was on her fourth deployment when the whole CST thing came about. Um, but she, Shannon always said that she wanted to be able to go through a selection process so she would have the same credibility as everybody else. But she had no desire to do, to, to attempt to, you know, jump in the stack and be a quote unquote shooter. She knew that she was much better suited going out and finding bad guys um, or going in places where men couldn't go or were adding to a signature where a woman, where a woman kind of, you know, makes everybody relax a little bit more. So you don't get uh, a lot of scrutiny on you. I mean, if me and you show up someplace, like there's not really a lot of question, like what Joe and Nick are up to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but these gringos, man, they're up to yeah, no good, man. Hey man, we're here for some like, you know, the party or diplomacy like that. Yeah, okay. Sure. Um, so I mean, she kind of knew what, what skills she brought. Um, she was looking forward to someday women being allowed to go compete and and earn whatever badge hat you know there is, so they actually had some some credibility. Um, so I, I think go, when, when people think about, hey, what are women going to do in soft because she can't, you know, a woman can't do what a guy can do. It's like, hey, man, the the soft community is huge, and soft does a bunch of different stuff. Not everybody's kicking down a door. So I, I think folks need to keep that in mind when they're getting super heated about uh, the can a girl show up and go to selection because women are going to start passing these courses. Like it's just a matter of time. There's some stud athletes out there. It's how we use them. I think that that onus I think is on soft leadership. If, if the answer is just to throw them right into a Ranger squad or right into a freaking line ODA or a SIF ODA. Okay. You just, you blew it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Seriously. I, that's just as short sighted as the other side of the coin. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there were some times I wish, you know, maybe if we had a female, it, things could have panned out a, a bit, a bit more different than it, than it had. So def, definitely, definitely assets that, that I will say. Well, man, I, I, I don't want to keep up, you know, keep you too long. Uh, plus people get, you know, they start getting bored when they, you know, listen to me drone on for anything longer, but dude, Thanks for coming on, man. That was, that was, that was great. And, you know, I appreciate your insight guys. Like I said, I I'll link, uh, I'll, I'll link, you know, uh, both articles of yours. I mean, I, I know you definitely too. Are there any others I'm missing? Yeah, I did one for uh, CNN Newsweek, a Breitbart one a while back. Uh, okay. This most recent one was. Uh, All right. Well, I'll, I'll do my research as a unprepared host and find all of Joe's works and you guys will find them in the description. Um, and I'll, I'll throw them up on Twitter too. So if you guys are listening on like Spotify, iTunes, you guys can go to my feed and I'll pin it right at the top. Um, so you, you can get a, a little bit deeper understanding of, of where Joe's been and, and why he believes the things that he does uh, because this is nuance and, and podcasts aren't really a good medium for nuance. Um, so you guys can find that there, Joe. Thanks brother. I really appreciate you having on. You ever want to come back on and just, I don't know if, if, if one day you wake up and you're like, Oh man, that really pisses me off. And you just want to <laughs> vent, man, dude, let me know, man. I'll throw you on. This is, it, this is easy. You're far more eloquent and well-spoken than I am. So I just let you dude, talk. And, <laughs> yeah. There's, there's, there were no ums and huhs and stutters. Like I have, you just kind of, <laughs> lectured on man yeah you know as a uh, as a warrant i just had to be really good at kind of running my mouth while other people did work so i had some uh some practice i can't believe you guys actually ran your mouth i would have figured that your <laughs> lips were wrapped around the rim of your coffee mug the whole time <laughs> gotta come <laughs> breathe every now and again <laughs> oh man anybody seen joe oh, he's got dental man he's out man yeah i think he would have got escaped. dental he had no. dental yesterday <laughs> oh all right, man. I appreciate it. Like yeah, I said, man. hopefully we talk to you again soon. Yeah, brother. Thanks for it. Thanks for doing this podcast. Hey, sure thing, buddy. All right, man. Take care. Take care, brother. Later. Later.